J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and today on my show, I'm joined by Ros Watkins, author of the crime thriller series, D.I. Meg Dalton. There are three books so far in the series, The Devil's Dice, Dead Man's Daughter, and Cut to the Bone. This series is based in the Peak District of Derbyshire in the United Kingdom, primarily because that's where the author Roz comes from. And she lives there with a whole menagerie of animals that keep her busy, especially when she likes to go out walking and thinking about, hmm, where shall I set the next scene and where's the next plot coming from? Roz hasn't always been a writer. In fact, she comes from a legal background specialising in patent law, something she thoroughly enjoyed as a professional person. She went to Newham College in Cambridge University to read engineering and natural sciences and diversified from there to patent law. And you might think, well, where's the connection? Um, We'll ask her about that in a minute. But Ross has explored various ventures in her life, So let's ask her to join me and maybe we'll find out a little bit more about her, her books, why she writes them and what's behind the scenes, everybody. Ross, welcome to my show, Talking Books. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. Oh, the experience and the pleasure is mine. And of course, um, we both know Alex Davis, who taught us how to, you know, creatively write books so this is the connection everybody and Ros lives in my part of the world Derbyshire in the United Kingdom so it's been a great pleasure to bring her on the show at last and talk to her about her books. Ros, I'm curious as to why you chose to write about crime thrillers. Was it because that's a genre you read as a young child as a, as a person and that it's a genre that you love? Um, it was a bit of a mixture, really. I do, I like reading crime, more psychological thrillers than police stuff, actually. Um, so when I first started writing, it was just, it was just for fun. Um, and I did intend to write a psychological thriller. Um, so I thought I'll write something I like reading and I'll also write something once I kind of got into it, I thought I might as well write something with a view to getting published, just almost just to have a goal, really, um, for, for all the work. Um, and I thought that that was quite a good genre to go for. Um, so I started off with a with a, a sort of a, a character who was supposed to be my main character. Um, and then her husband ended up dying, as people do. Um, but then I needed, a, a obviously, a cop. And this detective appeared, um, and that was Meg Dalton. And she kind of just limped into the scene, and she just took over the book, basically. So at that point, I I gradually, I tried to sort of stop her being the main character for a while. And then it was clear she was going to be the main character. So then I was writing, um, I didn't even know what they were called. I was writing a police procedural, I was told. and that meant I needed to find out about police stuff, which was quite a challenge, but it wasn't really a deliberate decision. Yeah, to... I'm coming to that in a minute. <laughs> so when you, um, you were thinking about, when you were thinking about the scenes, uh, the plots to put the storyline together, do you rely on um, a lot of your own personal experiences for, for in the first book, yes, the victim is a patent attorney similar to yourself. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I must have had some, must have been harboring some resentment for my former career I think, when he started killing off people that he used to work with. <laughs> no, I mean, she it's didn't do of, it literally, folks. She didn't do yeah, it literally. We just do it in our books. It makes us feel much better. Um, no, it's sort of, I mean, it, People say write what you know, which I think that's not to be taken too literally, because obviously I don't know any murderers. Um, But in terms of just sort of um, having someone who did a career that I understood, 
it, it, especially for my first book, I thought, let's not make it any more difficult than it already is. Um, and I knew that I could come up with sort of plots and subplots involving that career. Um, and I, when I was a pants attorney, actually, we used to joke about how few of them there are in fiction and on the TV. So um, it was quite fun to actually include some um, and, and obviously kill some and make some. Obviously, none of my uh, none of the people I work with are anything like the people in the book at all. Thank um, goodness for that. <laughs> yeah, no. So it was it it just made it easier and more fun, I guess, for my first book. Um, the character um, D.I. Meg Dalton is quite a complex character, and throughout the series, we see her battle with her inner inner demons. Um, at times, it appears, Ross, she's barely able to function as an individual herself, you know, let alone uh, trying to solve a, a murder and run an investigation team. And yet, and all her relationships with the other characters, you know, they're quite complex, they're not easy. Um, you know, her mother, her gran, her father, you know, Jay, Kate, Hannah, and of course, Craig. Um, you know, at best they're compassionate, but you know, at worst they're arduous, tricky relationships. Did you set this character out to be like that, to entertain the reader, you know, to give you know a lot of suspense to this storyline? Partly, yes. I mean, I didn't. I, I sort of didn't want her to be one of these sort of kick-ass types that you know oh, I don't know I think I'd watched quite a few things on TV where he had these female detectives and they were they were sort of glamorous with you know beautifully straightened hair and lots of makeup wearing tiny little skirts and, and high heels and somehow also catching criminals and looking beautiful at the same time and I, I, I think that's less the case in fiction in, in sort of books than on the TV um, but I just felt like I wanted to have someone who was a bit short and a bit fat and had a limp and, you know, was not, was not this kind of glamorous detective. Um, and then, yeah, some of the, some of the, the problems she has, um, some of it was stuff that I've experienced in my own life, um, but just everything magnified, I suppose. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd always been in male dominated environments and some of the stuff that that Craig comes out with is just more extreme versions of things that I've experienced or things that friends have experienced. Um, Would you describe Craig as like a misogynist? Yeah I mean Craig has his reasons actually there, there is something that yeah. happened to Craig uh, when he was a child which will eventually probably be revealed um, so I didn't want him to be completely one-dimensionally awful um, and he is loyal um so he you know he's he's hopefully quite a complicated character um but his knee-jerk reaction was against meg because she sort of came in above him and had been fast-tracked and he worked his way up and that makes sense i know that there is resentment about that kind of thing happening um so hopefully it was just a slightly more extreme version of what actually does happen. And people have confirmed that, you know, that they have met people like Craig in, in their jobs. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully he's not too extreme. But he brings an interesting facet to the storyline, everyone. He really does. <laughs> um, the character Meg is quite a dominant figure. And yet you do give her weaknesses, um, physical weaknesses, frailties, you know, her ankle. Um, and also, you know, emotional difficulties. Was this again done to create an effect of tension um, to keep the readers gripped to your storylines? Because at, at pivotal points, Ross, Meg falls apart, you know, both mentally and physically. And I found that absolutely absorbing. Did you do this deliberately? To an extent, yes. I mean, I wanted her to um, go through a sort of character arc, you know, that kind of um, 
to, to be affected by the plot. I didn't want her to be one of these detectives who sort of just treats it as a puzzle um, and doesn't really get emotionally involved. I wanted the story to impact her personally so that she was forced to confront her stuff from the past because um, that's the sort of book I like reading. I like books where it is emotional for the character and they do have to sort of confront their own weaknesses and, and grapple with them uh, rather than it just being a sort of you know they're able to stand back from it all and solve it all purely intellectually so I did want her to be clever and I wanted her to be solving it with her brain and her emotions rather than physically which is part of the reason why I made her physically not you know anything special she's just an ordinary person and she's got a limp um probably barely scraped through the police fitness tests um because I wanted her not to be able to just have a big fight at any point I wanted her to have to be cleverer than that hmm and I think that comes across very strongly in all the three books but when I look at you know the books throughout the books you touch on so many different aspects of life you know in the first book yes you, you touch on geocaching you touch on the psychic world, you touch on Huntington's disease, Greek mythology, and in Deadman's Daughter, you are including the character Hannah here, who is a, a wheelchair user and all the challenges that she faces. And you also, I mean, you touch on this slightly in the first book, The Devil's Dice, a sister dying, you, you know, her Meg's grandmother, who's terminally ill and you bring this to light again in the second book and it's quite emotional how you deal with this because Meg is a police officer and she can't do you know or she you know if she carried out some of the things that um you know people who do you know support a sister die she'd probably lose her job so she has to balance that up and then in the, um, the third book, Cut to the Bone, you know, you're talking about pig rearing, troughs, abattoirs. Um, you know, you are, you know, encompassing so many things in life into the books, not just the, the murder scenes and the murders itself. Mm -hmm. Did you do that again deliberately? Is that you drawing on all your, you know, aspects of life and bringing them to the fore in the books to give these books some brilliant flavour? Yeah, I think some of it is almost my way of, of dealing with things. I found it really helpful. So the assisted dying, my own grandmother had been in a situation where that would have really been a good thing for her. She was 101 um and very ready to go but um she obviously we couldn't help her without breaking the law and we would have done that but she didn't want us to break the law so you know you hear people who are against assisted dying saying oh well old people will feel uh, you know pressurized to just die to to sort of help the relatives out but actually i think it's often the opposite that um you know they feel pressurized to keep going so partly because they don't want you to break the law but partly because usually the relatives don't want the person to die um so that was really traumatic watching especially what my parents went through um looking after her at the end with every day her saying oh i hope this is the day i don't wake up in the morning and not able to help her so i think a lot of the feelings about that and perhaps some of the anger about that came through in the book um, and it's similar really with the with the the um, factory farming thread in, in Cuts the Bone that I'm furious that we keep pigs in crates where they can't turn around where they can't nuzzle their young um, you know it's like it's like spending your whole life in a sort of Ryanair aircraft seat possibly actually even worse, less room than that. Um, you know, unable to have any contact with their own kind. Um, I mean, in England, there are certain restrictions, so we, we can't do that for necessarily the pig's whole life, but 
Um, certainly for a mother pig giving birth, she'll be in this crate that she can't turn around um, for at least five weeks um, at a time. And then again, when she's pregnant again and having more, you know, another litter. So it, it's, it's appalling. Um, and I think I, some of my anger about that I brought into the book and it's, it's just a way for me to cope with it in a way. And I've had so many people have said, oh, it's made me think about the type of pork that I eat, you know, I'll make sure I buy free range organic because um, I don't want to be a part of this. So that, if that's made some small difference, um, then at least that's something I feel I've tried to do about it. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So in your books, you see, yes, they are crime thrillers, everybody. They are, um, you've, you've got all the crime scenes, you've got all this. And yet there are underlying stories in the books as well. Um, what I want to know, uh, Ross, is when you created the criminal murder characters, did you have to get into the, uh, very often the twisted and cruel mindsets of a criminal, the psychopaths, the serial killers? Did you have to go and look up criminal behavior, you know, understand criminal patterns? Um, how a murderer thinks by studying the criminal cases. Who did you, you know, where did you get that information from? Who did you turn to? Um, and do you base, you know, the, you know, your stories, are they authentic, you know, in relation to, you know, past historical cases? Have you picked up on them as well to develop this story? Um. I do a lot of research yeah, on the sort of psychology of it. I mean, I, I, like my, I like my murderers to have reasons rather than just being deranged psychopaths that kill people for the fun of it. Um, so there's, they're a mixture really. Mostly the murderers are people that think they're doing good, which I think is the case for most people. And you know, even people doing what look like terrible things they think they're doing the right thing. Um, so all my murderers are, are not psychopaths with one exception. Um, and for that exception, I did a lot of research on psychopaths, which was fascinating. I mean, you, you know, the internet's a wonderful thing, isn't it? So you, you've got oh, these it? things like, <laughs> I'm a psychopath, ask me anything, threads <laughs> that you can read down and it's fascinating you know, that you'll get an actual psychopath on there sharing how he feels about things, how he feels about his wife, who's also a psychopath, the sort of relationship they have where they agree that they'll be faithful, but they fully understand that if one of them is unfaithful, the other one will probably kill the children and them. And, and then you'll get these little sort of chilling little asides, like one of our children is a psychopath and the other one isn't. So there's this girl who's been brought up in this family where mum, dad and brother are psychopaths. Mm. And this guy just says, oh, we don't have pets. And you just think, oh, my God, what's behind that little comment? We don't have pets. I, I just so that's absolutely fascinating reading about them. Um, and also the fact that a large, a large percentage of the population, really, maybe one percent are technically psychopathic. But depending on your upbringing, you don't usually become a murderer, you usually become a, maybe a politician or even a surgeon or a business owner. You know, there are a lot of psychopaths, but if they're brought up in a way that good behavior is rewarded, rather like training a dog, they don't usually decide to go out killing people because well, why would you? You're likely to end up in prison, it doesn't make sense but they don't not kill people because they feel bad. They just do it because it's a stupid thing to do. Um, so they're really interesting. And you can imagine how in some walks of life, their talents could be useful where you've got to look at things dispassionately. Um, you know, most of us, if we see a baby that needs a million pounds spent on medical treatment, we don't want to spend the million pounds because we want to save the baby. Um, but of course, those decisions are made every day um, yeah. and you can't save all the babies. And maybe this is why we've evolved to have 1% of the population being psychopaths, because they make those decisions. And it, 
yeah, as, as you can see, I got sort of really sucked into this whole. You did. I did. I did. You did. She did, everybody. <laughs> Some of the characters, you know, I mean, her books are littered with dead bodies. <laughs> Oh, not as much as some. My body count's quite low, actually, compared to some. <laughs> what about the police proceedings? I, have to, I do have, have to add an extra one, actually. I was just thinking with my first book, when it was out on submission, um, one of the editors came back and said, oh, I think we need more murders. So I had to actually add an extra murder halfway through the book after I wrote it, which I think made it better. It did. I and mean, what about police procedures? Where do you get that from? Who do you draw upon for that? Um, I was lucky in that I, I had a friend who I'd sort of lost touch with, um, but someone that I used to know kind of years ago, and I got, managed to get back in touch with her, and she was um, a, a, a scene of crimes officer, CSI person. Um, and I remembered her stories, actually, from when I used to chat to her, and one of the things she told me ended up in the book where she got home from work and took her trousers off and maggots fell out of her turnips. And that, that, like that stayed with me, yeah, because some of the things she had to deal with. Uh, but her husband was actually a detective, so they've been brilliant. Um, I, I went through, when I wrote the first book, they read the beginning and they said, oh yeah, that's not how it worked at all with the crime scene. And we sat down for hours and they told me all about it over quite a few drinks and um as you wrote, do. yeah as you do rewrote it more accurately sent it to them and then they were like nah she was better before and they, they just said just stick with it not being super accurate because it's i mean my agent says to me drama trumps realism um so i I'm, i've met several detectives and they kind of got me um in, in with other detectives and I had a day with Derbyshire police which was brilliant and met people who were actually working uh, murder cases and met the drone unit and the, the firearms unit and that was really interesting mm. but all of them said you can't make it accurate it's actually really boring you know murder cases you'd have sort of 100 people looking at the mobile phone data and the, the you know number plate data and it's not interesting so we put little sort of bits of realism in there you know I sort of said what are the things that you bitch about when you're having a cup of tea and it's like the fact that all the forks disappear or the fact that people are always like taking the cars out and putting them in the room you know things just everyday everyday things. life yeah but so, the actual murder wow. investigation is not accurate <laughs> pretty there you go. So there's a little snippet, guys, behind the scenes of how she's put the plots together and storylines together. And for me, Cut to the Bone was the most chilling out of all the three books. You know, the pale child that dominates the storylines, the pig trough, the abattoir scenes, the emotions of rape. Um, Meg's father coming back and you're thinking, oh, why has he come back into the scenes? Now, what's he after? How did you knit this plot to create this spine thrilling, you know, twisting storyline, which I just found so absorbing? Sorry, everybody, but Cut to the Bone was the best one for me. Oh, well, thank you, because it was the hardest to write. Um, it was, it, yeah, it took, it took a long time and a lot of edits, actually. Because um, when I first, um, when I first got an agent, she said to me when she was pitching my first book out, she said, oh, can you give me a couple of paragraphs about books two and three? And I, I thought, yeah. I am, <laughs> okay, I, am, I had a bit of an idea for two, but no idea for three. So I just, I just put a couple of thoughts down. I had this idea about something going on in an abattoir. Um, I actually had an image of the, the you know, the, the sort of corpses of the pigs hanging and then a human one hanging and, and going along with all the pigs but that didn't end up in the book but that was the image I started with so I knew it want, I wanted it to be something to do with um, factory farming and a, and a murder but that was about it and then so suddenly you've got to write the thing um, so it evolved really rather than um, 
it wasn't really very well planned and it kept changing. I kept getting to 40,000 words and thinking, oh, no, it would be better if I did it this way. I um, can't remember where the idea of the pale child came from, but I knew I was fascinated by the reservoir with the drowned villages. Mm. Um, I knew I wanted to set it up there. But, now, um, that, I think, came from Carsington. Well, it's actually Lady Bower that's... Oh, is it Lady Bower? Yeah, oh. yes. It's, I use Lady Bower because that's... Uh, there may be something under Carsington as well, but there were definitely two villages under Lady Bower, um, which I just thought was really intriguing. But I made up the village where they supposedly moved people to, so no. that wasn't a real place. Um, but it, it's been harder since lockdown because I do just wander around and look at things in the Peak District and... and you know it can be quite creepy and things jump out at me but so would you classify yourself as a structured writer you know you write a specific time you set time aside during the day it's structured you do so many you know um words a day um or are you a bit like me ad hoc as the mood takes i'm quite ad hoc so oh uh, i like that yeah i mean it, yeah, when I wrote the first books, I was running, I was initially renovating these holiday cottages that we've got. Um, and I sort of joke that dealing with builders made me think about murdering people, which is uh, it's quite unfair, but <laughs> it's an element of truth. <laughs> so, um, Don't get on the wrong side of Ros Watkins, everybody. <laughs> I will murder you and put you in a book. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I was running the holiday cottages, which is quite a lot of work, actually. So I was doing a lot of kind of quite manual work um, and I was thinking about the books while I was cleaning the toilets and changing the beds and stuff yeah. um, and then the time I had free um, I would just get stuck in and write the books so it was very just whatever I could grab um, and then recently I've had a bit more time um, so I just yeah but it's not it's not structured it's more like just I found my As the mood was, takes you. Yeah, well, sort of. Yeah. You have to make the mood take you every you day, really, when you've got a deadline. <laughs> but you do. It, the I'm, problem is, you can get a bit obsessed with word count, which I did at the beginning. I had this little book and I wrote down how many words I'd done each day. And then I found actually that the, the hardest thing is the thinking, not the writing. Once you've decided what to write, the writing doesn't take very long, it's the thinking. So getting obsessed with word count was not a good thing for me. Um, it's better to just make sure you're thinking about it, like, a lot of the time. And not worry so much about words. I more. <laughs> would you, would, Ros, would you agree with me here? Um, the art of writing a really good murder, thriller, mystery is to keep the reader in suspense as to who did it, why do they do it and and keep the reader guessing right to the bitter end yet drop little hints along the way so that when you reveal who and why the reader goes ah you know no it wasn't them we thought it was them no it isn't that so you're keeping them in suspense and then when you do reveal it the reader can then see go back and think all those little dotted hints are all joined up and that's why they were put where they were mm. until she reveals everything. Do you think that is the best way to write a good crime thriller? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and of course you can go back and add the things afterwards. Um, so it's not like you have to have it all worked out in your head. Um, but yes, I think it's that, it's, it's that sort of making the, the, the ending surprising, but, also kind of inevitable as well um but i do i do sort of tend to track out motives and and reasons for several people and kind of have them all in the book as well so it almost could flip either way at the end um and in fact i have changed the murderer in the first two i think it didn't it, yeah, end up being someone different. Um, the third one, I kind of always knew the ending, but mm. I didn't know anything else. <laughs> so do you ever find yourself, you put something in and thought, hang on here, 
uh, no, that's not the right, that's not the right person. Mm. And you've got to go on backtrack. Yeah, well, you want it to be, you want to almost surprise yourself as well sometimes. It's quite nice when you think, actually, it could be them. She so, wasn't in that coffee shop back then, was she? Mm. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes you realise you've put something in earlier that you didn't realise you'd put in. It was almost a subconscious thing. And then it all fits together with something later that you don't yeah. think you only just decided. But actually, you must have decided subconsciously months before. Yeah. Well, I do that. I did that. I mean, as a child, Ross, and as a young woman, who inspired you the most? And what authors inspired you the most? And what authors inspire you today to write? Well... Who fascinates you? <laughs> so when I was a child, um, we were just coming out, I think, of the phase where Amy Blyton was very frowned on. So... Um, it was, I, and I loved her. Yeah. Brilliant. So they they were in our library, but I think there's been a phase earlier where they hadn't even been in the library. Um, so yeah, I loved Enid Light as a kid. I read all the Secret Seven, Famous Five, all that sort of thing. So that was obviously my start of <laughs> kind of mystery writing. Um, and then I moved on to Dick Francis, which yeah. um, I had ho I had the, a horse, and I used to kind of effectively fund my horse by looking after um, race horses, which um, I now, I'm really not a fan of the racing industry at all, but I was young, <laughs> didn't know any better. So uh, yeah, I was absolutely addicted to Dick Francis um, and used to read them multiple times. Um, weirdly, I never got into Agatha Christie, which is, I don't know why, I think I must just have not happened to come across her at that point, because um, I feel like I would have loved them if I had. Um, but, and then, yeah, as I got older, just a real mixture of things, really. I, um, I mean, things like We Need to Talk About Kevin was one of my favourites, but I've, I've read a real range of stuff from kind of Jeanette Winston, sort of magic realism through to um, psychological thrillers like Gone Girl and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, Gillian Flynn, I, I do love her writing, I and mean, Gone Girl was a obviously a massive hit but some of our others are fabulous as well that sort of thing um, i mean um ellie griffiths the uh, the lantern men's author mm -hmm. she um she gave you a little piece about your book to cut to the bone a very um lovely piece here and if i look at it it says here it says i love ross watkins book she's one of the best crime writers out there oh, i know that was so nice oh, she, she's so brilliant um but yeah, yeah, she spontaneously said something nice about one of my books on Twitter, which, which was so yeah. nice of her. So then, of course, my publicist is like, right, can we grab that? Grab, grab that. Grab it. <laughs> take it. Yeah. So what's in the pipeline, Ross? What's coming down the road? Right. Well, you know, Meg's, -wise. Meg's having a sabbatical at the moment. Um, she probably needs a break. She needs it. Last three books yeah, to recover maybe I'm operational or ankle um and so I've got a standalone that I'm working on at the moment called the red house um which is a sort of aftermath of a, of a family annihilation in which a teenage boy um murders most of his family but his little sister survives um the teenage boy is now a, a grown man but he, he's been in a vegetative state ever since that day and the book opens with um, the question about whether he might actually be conscious um, and whether maybe something mm -hmm. different happened that night um, to what everyone thought. So that's, yeah, that's what I'm working on at the moment. And some more and then, DI Meg, what Daltons? Um, I've got a contract for more Meg. So um, I think we need to decide with my publisher really whether I do another standalone next. Um, I think I'm, that probably will be what we'll end up doing um, and then probably back to Meg after that. So, yeah. it's, mm. um, Ross, where can people go and get your books? Um, Waterstones is good or oh, independent bookshops. Um, we've got brilliant Scarthin books near us um, and it is worth double checking that they've got stuff in stock because it's a while since um, some of the books came out so they don't always not all bookshops keep stock um, and of course there is always Amazon they're always available 
Um, there's also Hive online um, where you can get um, that sort of support independent bookshops um, and Wallstones online as well. So various, various options, all good bookshops. Absolutely. And if they go to your web page, they'll get, find out a little bit more about you, won't they? And again, they can get the link there to go and get the book. Yes. And at this podcast, at the end of the link, you can go and get the books, everybody. They're truly wonderful. Um, so thank you, Ross, for coming on the show. It's given me a glimpse into your world of how you create the stories, you build the characters, um, letting us know who inspired you in the past and who inspires you today you know, in the world of literacy. And I say to a lot of the listeners, if you are lovers of Anne Cleves, Susie Steiner, Val McDermott, then you are going to like Ros Watkins. So I simply say, go and give her a go, everybody. There are three books. The first one is The Devil's Dice. The second one is Deadman's Daughters. And then my favorite, Cut to the Bone. So these books are detailed, everybody. They are packed with twists and turns and they're rich with such gripping suspense. For me, they are real page turners. And that's what a really good crime book should be about, turning those pages and, you know, the author keeping you guessing all the time as to who did it and why they did it. That's what I love crime thrillers. So if you're a crime thriller enthusiast like me and looking for a new author, add to your collection, Ross Watkins. Give her a go, everyone. There are dead bodies all over the place, as you've heard. She even had to put some back in again. So, but for the time being, I'm going to leave these um, um, riotous stories for you to go and read and enjoy. As I say at the end of each podcast, I'm JT Crowley. So wherever you are in the world, stay safe. Until next time, stay listening. Thank you. Thank you.